In the world of modern Yiddish literature, there are few figures more important than Sholem Aleichem, whose works about shtetl life have become archetypes of the Jewish experience at the turn of the 20th century. Joseph Dorman is the director of a new documentary about Sholem Aleichem, and we headed down to East Broadway on the Lower East Side to talk with him about the few difficult years he spent living in New York and his complex views of America. Sholem Aleichem first came here in 1906. He had, enor you know, he was the great Jewish writer of his day. He was lionized. And he had every expectation that he was going to fall into a bucket of gold when he came to America. So he's greeted by the, the great uh, Yiddish, Jewish luminaries, cultural luminaries of the day. And um, he has this great expectation of becoming a, a playwright, a great Yiddish playwright on what was then a thriving, thriving Yiddish stage. I mean, a remarkably vibrant uh, cultural venue at the time. For his grand opening, Sholem Aleichem debuted not one, but two plays on the evening of February 8th, 1907. When one opens the Yiddish press the next day, he gets savaged. Abe Kahn in the forwards, um, he, he liked certain parts of it, he gave him his due, but he basically spent his time as Jewish critics sometimes do, finding the flaws in the play, not necessarily its best parts. The American Jewish uh, community and the Yiddish cultural community was a very powerful, faction-ridden, vibrant entity. And everyone had certain reasons for championing certain people and knocking others. Having become embroiled in the Yiddish cultural politics of the day, he returned to Europe in 1907 after spending only one year in America. But it wasn't long until Sholem Aleichem found himself back in the United States. Sholem Aleichem returns to New York in 1915. And uh, at this point in his life, he really is once again broke. He's been to America once had this disaster with the theater, really didn't want to come back, but he was caught in Europe during World War I. So he comes back to America and he needs work. So he's looking for a job as a columnist, as an everyday columnist, or a twice a week columnist, really, for some place in the Jewish press. And um, so the question really ended up being, does he do the Tog? Does he do the Forberts? And there's Abe Kahan, and Abe Kahan is the man who, a few years back, had savaged his play Khan was known as kind of a czar. He was a great editor, but he was an editor with a very big ego, who had very strong opinions, and who was known to, uh, at times, meddle and start to edit his contributors, particularly as they gained fame. So here was Shalom Aleichem, a man who had reached the pinnacle of his career, and I think he had very little interest in having Abe Khan meddle in his work. So Shalom Aleichem wisely took his uh, wares to their talk, where he became, became a twice a week columnist. He spent the last few years of his life living and writing in New York, and his funeral was an important moment for the entire Jewish community. The Educational Alliance happens to be one of the stops on uh, the great funeral procession uh, for Shalom Aleichem when he died here in 1916. And all these factions all of a sudden came together to celebrate or to honor the life of Sholem Aleichem on his death. So all these groups got together and they planned this remarkable, remarkable funeral that wound its way down this procession from the Bronx, from Kelly Street, all the way through Manhattan, stopping along the way and into where he was first buried in a, in a cemetery in the Bronx. But it was this remarkable uh, event in the life of New York City and certainly in the life of Jewish New York City. This, this group of initially young people and still young community all of a sudden numbered hundreds of thousands of people who could all be brought together and therefore were, it was the beginning of the Jewish uh, community as a political force in America. Though his life in the United States was marked by difficulties, his views on the American experience were complex and layered. He, he really had a very ambivalent relationship to the country. Um, early on in his writings, um, even way before he'd ever come here, around the 1880s, he recognized, even at that point, that America was a kind of land of salvation for the Jews. It was literally, he even described it in, in religious terms as a God-given land 
that was providing a, a, a home, a safe home for Jews. At the same time, he really saw it as, as a place where people were on the make in, that, in the worst sense of the word and where Jews were potentially in danger of losing a kind of Yiddishkeit and a community and a, a whole series of traditions that they'd been holding on to for thousands of years. And, and he w was frightened that Jews would, would lose that culture here for all the wrong reasons, for materialism, for the worship of money. And yet, he at that very moment finds it somehow in his artistic self to write these stories, Malto Pesid and Kazans. And they are, unlike so many of his other stories, which are sharply critical of American capitalism, really a peon to America and a peon to the immigrant experience and the possibilities for Jews in America. And, and there's something deeply poignant about that. He could still see the possibilities for America. He could see that the American Jewish community and America was going to do great things for the Jews, even if he couldn't quite go along for that ride. As someone who spent a lot of my life as a non-religious Jew who dips in and out of synagogue from time to time, struggling with what the nature of my own Jewish identity, Shalom Aleichem is a natural, because that's what all his stories are about. They're about what does it mean to be a Jew? And what, what's that all about? And reading him helps me think about that. As, as someone said, it's, he doesn't necessarily give you the answers, but he allows you to ask the question, and he's allowed me to ask that question consistently over the last decade, and that's been really, really important for me.